If you want to even make this more practical, go home tonight as you no doubt will. At a certain point, desire to have a cup of water or a cup of tea. But don't open the cupboard to get a clean cup. Look into the sink. And I'm sure you can find a couple of dirty cups, okay? Just pour clean water in those dirty cups and just drink. But you won't do it. Why would you want to pour something very clean into something that's very dirty? You could, if you're profoundly stupid, but a more intelligent person would say, you know what, I'm just going to wash this, dry it, and then pour myself a nice cup of coffee. So do you have to be empty to listen? It depends what kind of listening you're talking about. You think I'm going to enjoy like you coming to class, listening, and then forgetting? You think I enjoy like you coming to class, listening, and then no texting me, no emailing me until Monday? Yeah? You think I'm very different than Gilgamesh? You think I enjoy being forgotten? You think that's the kind of listening I enjoy? You coming to class, like winking at me from there? Yeah, I'm really listening to you. Oh yes, I'm also asking some questions. If you were to imagine language, words, speech, to be like seeds, and if you were to imagine yourself to be this plot of land, well, the task, first of all, is how fertile is your soil? Because if inside you're just made of concrete, well, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how animated and excited I become. You don't have the capacity to hold anything. So, if by listening you mean getting pregnant by ideas, uh, and those ideas forcing you to begin to sacrifice things, and they happen organically, naturally. Remember, you don't have to sacrifice anything as long as you are, you're passionate. Sacrifice happens when you're between two rocks. Should I go to class, or should I stay home and watch Mission Impossible? It's tonight, isn't it? It came out tonight. It's open. My brother and his family are going and watching uh, Tom Cruise. But, so yes, you have to be empty. Can you do it on your own? No. You and I have too many blind spots. You may assume that you're open to possibilities, but you're really not. Add to it the fact that you and I have experiences. Those experiences create history create psychological narratives, and by default, they create biases. So whenever you listen to something, you listen with a good amount of bias and prejudice. In other words, judgment is, lives inside you. Now, the other mistake that often is made is you assume that just because you listen, you understand. When you work with someone uh, on the path of self-knowledge, for the first, first maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on who you are, what you are, what your history is, the only purpose of listening is to feel. Now, all of us have this habit of wanting power to figure out what exactly are we listening to, what does this mean, how can I manage myself, how can I diminish the intensity of all the things that I feel, that is a mistake. You have been given a gift which is feeling. Because life will eventually turn you into a calculator, into a tax collector. You have to be very, very cunning to survive life. Okay? Now, you have to be a bundle of confusion. Lots of intense feelings. You know, the dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross would say. You want to understand, but you can't. You know, and... So the first function of listening is to just kind of feel. And then there comes a stage where you have ceased to be an emotional junkie. In other words, something about you, for some strange reason, no one knows how it happens. 
something about you listens, feels, and slowly begins to understand. Then if you have the patience, you feel, you understand, and then you realize there is nothing to feel and nothing to understand. There comes a point where there are these openings within you where you want to express the things you used to feel and the things you used to understand. Now you find yourself in a dilemma because expressing feelings, insights, are going to be a little difficult. <clears throat> and then what needs to happen is uh, you need to write for a while and then you need to listen to the things you write to see the gaps, the inconsistencies. I mean, it's no different than really, you know, uh, making a sword. Your own self creates this pit of fire. You put your emotions in there, you bring them out, you hammer them, you cool them off, you put them back in there. It's a way to refinement, but it can only be done through, you know, pain. If you were to look at uh, the gospel, I think of Matthew, uh, he who sits next to me sits next to fire. It's true. You can't sit next to your father who has cancer and just act stupid. You feel too much. You're losing too much. So laughter just abandons you. Anyone else? No one? Julian? Is there does more I guess narcissism set in as someone who's out in the uh, stages of mental stages? Yeah, you have to be selfish in a healthy way. Uh, but then the question is, what kind of a self are we talking about? Are we talking about a self who desires to be around Snoop Dogg? Are we talking about a self that desires to hang out with Malcolm X? Are we talking about the self that desires to be around Jesus Christ? Because all these different people will create a different type of selfishness. You know, the question is, to whom are you gravitating? What are you being sold? What sort of desires are you going to be having? What sort of ambitions will you be having? So the more refined, you know, and there are some people like Lil Wayne, when he was asked about the Black Lives Matter movement, he just says, I don't care about that stuff. I just want to make money and be rich. And throws a temper tantrum and leaves the interview. You know. So, like all the things I've said previously, <clears throat> you have to be sold uh, a self that's going to conflict and contradict all the other forms of advertisement. And you won't understand it, and you will hate the person who has given you this sort of idea as to who and what you should be. But if you are able to survive it, you'll reap the benefits in 10 years' time. But selfishness is part of who and what you are. You know, do you have children? Thank God. Uh, the moment the child is born, they're selfish. And it continues till the time you die. But as you mature and gain more experience and insights, understand perhaps what pleasures are good for you, which ones are bad for you, your sense of self you know, changes. If, for example, uh, let's just say I text you. I say, Julian, you know, we're going to have a gathering tomorrow. And you say to me, oh, I'm really sorry. I promised my friends that we're going to go and watch a movie. I will never, ever text you again. Do you understand why? There you go. Okay. Anyone else? Is the way <laughs> the way <laughs> is the, is the way to deal with the arrogance of youth through presenting them with beauty? Present with what? With beauty. 
outside of themselves, or is it something else? <laughs> So, are you a Catholic? So in Catholicism you have the seven deadly sins and every sin has its counter. So the counter to greed is contentment, for example. The counter to pride is humility. So your question, I think, the way it should be formulated, and forgive me, it's how does pride come about? And once you've been infected by pride, what steps do you take to attain humility? And what does that look like? Pride is very natural. And by pride, I mean the assumption that you know how things go, and you know what to do, and you know how to use the stuff around you. It's like all children. It's their pride rooted in just stupidity or just being naive and innocent and lack of experience. They want to run across the street uh, that they think they can run faster than a car coming their way 60 miles an hour. So all of us are contaminated by that. It's very, very organic, okay? There is also this pride that happens. Imagine you sit in this class, you've read maybe the Gospels once, and that was only when you were drunk. Uh, so you come to class, let's say this class, and you say, I'm a Christian because I've read the Gospel of Matthew, and let me tell you what it says. Now, what usually happens because we are, there is a thing inside us, and remember, pride, think of pride as an organism, and take that organism and inject it within the context of Charles Darwin. It's a living entity that will do whatever it can to continue its existence and survival. It wants to prosper, it wants to grow. It's not going to go away easily, it will fight. Okay, so even though I will tell you, for example, that there are 35 Gospels, and that the Jesus story is very similar to the stories of Hercules, for example, you will say, oh, no, no, that's not the case. And I will bring you resources, I will bring you facts, I will bring you figures, but you will not back out. It's the pride that keeps you in. Okay. Good morning, Guinea. And so the question is, well, how does one overcome all of that and become receptive to, say, the lecture given by Bart Ehrman? He's one of the scholars uh, that basically knows the ins and outs of the New Testament. Uh, I actually don't know how, uh, I mean the thing is if, if this was an easy how-to, anyone out there that you would find arrogant, you would just bring them in, you know, baptize them in some ways, and then push them out and say, okay, and change their name to Mr. Humble, you know. Uh, so we know how pride comes about. We just don't know at what stage um, it's replaced by humility and what sort of experiences you need to have. Now, make no mistake, all of us have these moments, despite how arrogant you may be and how boastful you may be and how hubris you may be, there are these moments where life breaks you. They're very private. It's, it's like as if the ground upon which you've been walking all of a sudden disappears, you fall into this dark pit if you happen to have been raised and seasoned by a religious environment, maybe you'll pray. If not, you'll pick up the bottle and drink some. And the point is that when we say that something is part of the human condition, it means that it is universal. Everyone experiences this at some point in their life. Okay? Now, Uh, 
sometimes what you call pride, it's a projection that is imposed upon you by people. Is for example, Socrates walking around town calling everyone an idiot, for example. Or Jesus coming down saying, or if you've read the Gospel of John, it's perhaps the only Gospel where he refers to himself. It's called the I Am Gospel. He says I about 50 times. I am God. Well, you can't be more arrogant than that. You know, before Adam I was. I am the light. I am the bread. I am the door. I am the this. I am the that. He's everything. Okay. Now, someone who doesn't perhaps know uh, the spiritual tradition, the journey that perhaps Jesus took, um, when you take a journey into the desert, whether it's psychological or physical or both together, it's a profound act of humility that society can't offer you much. You can't offer yourself much. There is nothing out there that can offer you any sort of a nourishment. So you kind of get sad and depressed. You're lonely. You're desperate. You just go into the wilderness. Again, uh, it's like you sitting in this class, but you realize I have nothing to offer you. None of these people have anything to offer you. You don't really know if you want the three units. Not even the three units is that attractive to you. But there are moments in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus exercises a great act of humility, but he does that before God. It's not for us, it's for God. So you have someone like Socrates or Jesus or Malcolm X that they are humble before the craft, but profoundly, they seem profoundly arrogant before the common person such as me. Okay, so when you talk about pride, the question is what kind of a pride are we talking about? Is it a pride that someone wanted to become really proficient at a craft? You know, let's say I've been playing piano for the past 20 years and you just picked up the instrument a couple days ago and you keep screaming, let me play. But what you need really is a good slap. Just sit in your seat, shut up, let me play for an hour. Then when I'm done, after I've given you some pleasure, Okay, then I'll give you like two seconds. You can sit and realize how stupid you really are at the piano. Okay, if on the other hand, you know, you go somewhere and you practice about 20 years, then you come back. You know, and I think whenever you're good at anything, for the most part, you keep your mouth shut. In other words, if you have internalized some aspects of your craft. And um, I'll tell you a story, and then we'll move into Taoism if there are no other questions. There was a man who hears that this king is looking for a just judge. And he says, well, I think I'm qualified <laughs> for that position. He's a fisherman. So he goes home and he takes a shower and he wears his most expensive three-piece suit. You know, and he walks the streets and he runs into the king and his people. The king looks at him and says, wow, you know, you look great, but what's that fishing net? It looks bad, it smells, it's old. And he says to the king, you know, I was once a fisherman. Uh, I was very poor, but I caught a lot of fish, made lots of money, bought myself a lot of mansions. And then I realized the evils of money, power, arrogance, that I could very easily forget my past. Being a fisherman kept me humble. Now that I'm rich with money, once in a while I sense my arrogance oozing out. So I always keep this fishing net as a symbol, as a reminder of my past. And the king looks at this man and is inspired, moved says, yes, this is the person we need to have as a judge. He gets a job. Weeks pass by, the king runs into the man again. He's still wearing this nice outfit, but what's missing is the fishing net. The king looks at the guy and says, what happened to the net? He says, what use is the net once the fish has been caught? You know, for those of you who, whether because of this class or other classes or whether temperamentally you're just geared 
to move towards these ideas, the act of desiring to understand is an act of poverty, is an act of humility that you don't take your own intellect too seriously. You begin to read and read and read and listen and write and have conversations with people who perhaps know more than you. And then what happens is you go to school, you get a couple of degrees, then you refer to yourself as a doctor. And then the information that at one point in your life you were interested in because you felt gaps in your understanding, now that feeling is gone. You simply receive the information to spit them out, whether you feel them, understand them, besides the point, but you're filled with arrogance and power. So, long story short, Yes, anyone else? Okay. So let's talk about Taoism. Um, did you? Okay. I have no doubt that if in the future you take classes in Asian philosophy or religious studies or Buddhism or whatever, they're going to give you some of the things that I've said in a completely different way and it's probably much better for you because uh, I have a tendency of just rambling on, making up things that doesn't really exist in the tradition itself. Uh, so just in case you find yourself interested in the Taoist tradition, you begin to read some books and uh, one day you sit and you say, wait a minute, I took this class with that guy some years ago, he was really quite wrong about most of it. Uh, so let me apologize <laughs> beforehand. One of the ways that the human journey is expressed in the Epic of Gilgamesh is we are told that all of us have uh, certain qualities about us that are very, very, very attractive. They can be physically attractive, emotionally attractive, intellectually attractive, even spiritually attractive. And the problem with that particular beauty is that it doesn't bring about humility, it brings about arrogance and pride. Where you use your attractive qualities to coerce, to manipulate, to exploit other people. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the ways that Gilgamesh was educated to learn how to be human once again is he had to fall in love with someone who lived in the forest. And by forest, I don't mean that they live in the middle of the jungle that their thinking, their feelings about themselves, about life is very organic, it's very natural, it hasn't been touched by society, it's not the outcome of reading books, uh, it's what we call in Christianity the Holy Spirit, that it just enters into you and guides you. Now initially of course it's going to be very difficult for Gilgamesh to kind of understand why he's so attracted to Enkidu, but he is nevertheless, and Enkidu is proud because he knows what beauty is. Enkidu is proud because he knows what it means to be a human being. Gilgamesh, he has forgotten what any of those things means. He just knows that people are finding Enkidu as attractive as himself. And so he doesn't like that. So out of jealousy, envy, angi, anger, they begin to wrestle. And in this wrestling match, what will happen is that you begin to spend a good amount of time with your counterpart. What you don't know is that this wrestling match will eventually create this intense desire inside you that you begin to fall in love with Enkidu. And this love that you begin to have for Enkidu brings about humility. You no longer care about yourself. You no longer care about your desires. So the answer to the question, how do you get rid of pride? Well, it's really love. 
But the question is, how long is your humility going to last? It depends what kind of love you're engaged in. <clears throat> and regardless of the love you have inside you, you're going to be broken because that's what love does. It breaks all of us. Now, the more superficial the love, the less longevity, the less brokenness, and the less humility, and the sooner your arrogance is going to come to the surface again. Now, what happens when Gilgamesh loses his companion Enkidu is that he comes to realize that life is hollow. Without love, love, life is not worth living. But not love for sex, but not love for money, not, not love for superficial entertainments. Love for someone like Enkidu, who is innocent, who has beauty, who has humility, and he can't find anyone who has those qualities in society. And then he has humility for his own understanding. He can't self-deceive. He goes into the wilderness, is tried, is challenged, is tested, and eventually he becomes immortal. That's why we speak about him some five, ten thousand years later. So that's how you morph from having a shell that looks like a human being to actually becoming one. In Hinduism, you have pleasures of the body, you have pleasures that come with money and power, you have pleasures that come with relationships. And then you realize all of a sudden, they're all good, don't get me wrong, all of them are good. At a certain point in your life, you come to realize that you're just worth more. There is something about it that hungers for more. That though you know, your physical life inspires you, beautifies certain aspects of your interior. You realize your capacity for much, much, much bigger things in life, but you don't know what they are. And when you realize that something from within is missing, naturally, the arrogance that would have contaminated you because you had money, because you had power, because you had a relationship, because you were ambitious, they all disappear. And now you fall into this dark pit and at a certain stage, if you're lucky, a human being, whether a man or a woman or a child or something, walks into your life, they call him or her a guru. If it's a woman, it's a guruette. Is that true, Chris? And uh, the word guru means someone who gets rid of your darkness and replaces them with light. And then what happens, very much like the epic of Gilgamesh, you have no choice but to fall in love with your teacher, guru, and that love empties you, and your guru will talk, and then you enter into yana yoga, which is you become one with the wisdom of your teacher, not because you understand it, but he or she inspires you. Then you realize that what your teacher has done to your interior, what love has done to your interior, it has made you a solitary, reclusive human being. So you sit in your room, there is no place to go, there is nothing to do. You long and you yearn for your teacher and for the wisdom of your teacher because these are the only things that can give you life and meaning. And once you graduate, you enter this place called Dharma Yoga, which is you have lived a solitary life you were always facing the sun to be enlightened. The sun has given you what your capacity allows. Now you need to turn your back to the sun and face sun's creation, which is human beings, animals, plants, whatever. And you have this newfound respect for all things alive or dead. But the core force of transformation, even in Hinduism, as it was the case in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is love. That's the first important component you need to have within you. Then you have Buddhism. You're born, you have fun. At a certain point, experiences no longer excite you, inspire you. They lose their intensity over you. You're no longer held hostage by them. You begin to realize that your life has been a complete waste then you want to understand. But very much like Hinduism, you need to find a bodhisattva, you need to find a teacher, and that teacher will teach you 
how to concentrate, how to be mindful, <coughs> what sort of pleasures are good, what sort of pleasures are bad. And then that's your salvation. Taoism is no different. They say the same thing in a different way, using different concepts. So, number one. There are five steps or five components. Some of them are mainly for teachers. Some of them are for both teachers and students, but they function differently within the teacher as opposed and the students. Okay, so first, is water. Sometimes you go hiking and all of a sudden you see this spring of water oozing out of the ground. And it's a thing of wonder, and you have to kind of sit back and say, man, this is really, really exciting. And you look at the water, it's really clean and pure, and you drink, and it tastes and feels really, really good. But it comes from the belly of the earth. It's not been touched by human beings. There are no pipes. They're just running deep down. That's one type of water. There is another type of water that the clouds gather, I don't know what they do, and all of a sudden rain falls. It's not been touched by human beings. It comes down from the heavens. And if you're in India and it's the monsoon season, you grab a bar of soap, you go outside and you clean yourself because society has made you dirty. That's another kind of water. Then there is the sort of water you find in Antarctica. It's frozen, it's cold. The sun hits the snow, it slowly melts. There is another kind of water. It's about a human being, a student, who has to climb upwards to figure out where the sun is, to walk away from society. And as you go higher and higher on Mount Everest, things get colder and colder and colder and colder. And as you continue this journey, you realize the only person who's on this journey is you and you alone. And the only way you can survive the aloneness is you slowly become detached. So the first quality you have is ice as a teacher that gets hit by the sun and parts of the teacher turn into water that quenches our thirst. Now here are a couple of things about water. It makes itself available to anyone, for any reason. There are some containers in this classroom, they are filled with water or some liquid. And all these bottles take different shapes, different forms, different sizes. The water never objects. It allows itself to be contained by whatever. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, something really, really interesting happens. Jesus knows that he needs to abide by certain traditions, Jewish law, which is he needs to be baptized by who? By John the Baptist. And despite the fact that he is in fact God incarnate, he is water enough to submit himself to John the Baptist. And even when John tells him, I should come to you for baptism and yet you come to me. He says, well, this is the tradition. Everyone must follow the tradition, even me. He has a mother 
when he goes back home, but there is also the synagogue. But something about them, like Enkidu, is very natural and organic. And that which is organic, water-like inside him, says you should flow towards the synagogue, not towards your mom. Your mom belongs to the earth. She has the feelings of a mother. You should go to the synagogue because that's where seekers are, that's where God is. And so he hangs out with some rabbis. And then he goes out. Some people say, can we follow you? He says, fine. A few minutes later, Matthew, the tax collector, comes to him and says, oh, so you do magic tricks. I can come to your house. We can have food together. The point I'm trying to make ultimately is teachers have a tendency of hanging out with anyone who will receive them. They don't live in gated communities. <coughs> Okay. Water also has a tendency of washing all things dirty clean. It just removes contaminants. That is the function of any good teacher. If you happen to be hanging out with lepers like Saint Francis of Assisi, that's what you do. You don't give sick people the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, you wash their feet. If someone is hungry, you give them food. Water is very insightful. It gives to people what they can receive and no more. Now, Water is also profoundly cunning. Very, very, very cunning. All of us have a good amount of society inside us. All of us have a good amount of culture inside us. Therefore, all of us come with a good amount of glitches, viruses, toxins. Teachers usually don't fight to remove them. Like water, they simply go around the obstacle, slowly, gently. Let me give you an example. And uh, I borrow this from, again, the Gospel of Matthew. Now, one of the things about the ancient world is that if you happen to be a Jew and someone is not a very serious Jew and they happen to be, in fact, a tax collector, when they enter your space, they defile it. They contaminate it. So you never allow a tax collector to come to your house. That bias just lives inside you. So Matthew finds himself in Peter's house. I think it's Peter, yeah. Now, it's where Jesus is giving a sermon. Nobody likes Matthew. In fact, for that community, Matthew is not redeemable. Everybody wants to kick him out. You know what Jesus does? He looks at him and says, People here don't like you. I don't care to know why, but if you want, I can come to your house and um, we can have supper. He doesn't tell him about money. He doesn't tell him about Romans. He doesn't tell him about the harm he's doing to commoners by taking what little money away from them. He doesn't do own any of that stuff. He doesn't fight him. He just says, make some dinner, I'll come to your house. And Matthew says, you're going to come to my house? You know who I am? I kill people. I destroy people's livelihood. And yet you want to come to my house? Yeah. And you know when he goes into Matthew's house, you know what he sees? He sees people who are drinking and he sees prostitutes. But you know what he does? 
He doesn't pass a single judgment upon any of them. He doesn't say to the prostitutes, Oh, you guys are selling your body for what? And you're drinking? What about Yahweh? You know, he's everywhere. He sees everything. Don't you fear hell, damnation? None of that stuff. And you know what he says to them? I want to tell you a story. And what's the story, prodigal son? The fact that all of us lose our ways. All of us, without exception. Even Jesus lost his way in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let this cup pass by me. I don't want to do this anymore. But then he catches himself. And when he tells the story to the people who are drunk or having orgies or wanting to have orgies, you know, to the person who's just focused on money, all of a sudden, Matthew looks at Peter and they both begin to weep and they embrace and they become devoted disciples of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? He then said, well, let me give you the canon, the Jewish law. None of that stuff. The other thing you need to know about water is it never seeks a high position. It always remains invisible. Next time it rains or next time the faucet is running, or next time the hose to the front yard, the backyard, you forgot to shut it off. Just pay close attention to where the water is going. It always goes to the lowest of the lowest of places in your physical environment. It doesn't want to stay on the mountaintop. That's not where it belongs. I have not come for the righteous. I have only come for the sinners. But not those who simply assume to be sinners. Those who really know, feel that they are sinners. At what stage do you go to therapy? When you know that you've come to realize you've done all that you have could. You have drank, you've smoked, you've fought, you've poured, you've done a thousand and one things to no avail. At last, there is a good amount of humility. You carry your sorry little behind to some therapist's office and then you open the dungeon, the vault, and you say, this is my history. So, those who are arrogant enough to find themselves at the peak of the Everest, think they're up there, water has no use for them. It's not interested in them. Water is only interested in those who are sick. In the case of Jesus or Lao Tzu, spiritually sick. They feel an emptiness. Some sort of a discontent. Okay. So these are some of the defining qualities of, I suppose, any good authentic teacher. That first they are invisible. Um, Anayat Khan, uh, he was born in India, I think, I don't know, 18 something. He was also a musician, he was a Sufi. He gave birth to some sort of an order, I forget. There is an 11 volume book, um, what is it called? Something, I don't know, Anayat Khan collection. It's uh, quite bad, but there are some places in the book that's relatively interesting in the 11 volumes, where he says, you know, when you go out with a Jew, be a Jew. When you go out with a Christian, be a Christian. When you go out with someone who's gay, Accept them. When you go out with someone who is straight, accept them. When you go out with someone who is trans, accept them. It doesn't matter who you're out with. Accept people for who and what they are. Don't make them feel bad. If you want to educate them, be like water. Okay? Be like a thief at night. 
So for those of you in this class who may at one point find yourself in despair and you may be looking for like some guidance, i.e. a teacher, you first need to ask yourself if you have found yourself in the lowest of the lowest of the lowest places so the teacher can find you useful. In other words, he or she can enter you and stay there, <coughs> okay? Because if you're not a good container, or if you're not a container, you can't receive anything. <coughs> now, so that's the first uh, component of being a good Taoist. And that's specifically uh, designed for teachers, being like water. <coughs> 